he was essentially fused from the bottom part of his spine all the way up to the top. So from C2, almost the highest vertebrae in the neck, all the way down to his pelvis. This is a relatively rare case as far as spinal deformities go. His body was constantly fighting his fused spine in order to stand upright. So when James walked in the room to see me, his head was facing the ground. At that point, I knew we were dealing with something serious. James is a 34-year-old male, immigrated here from a different country. He developed, as he went through his teenage years, a condition that's called ankylosing spondylitis. Ankylosing means fusing together, Spondylitis means inflammation of the spine. This over the years had led to a significant disability, not only from a functional standpoint, but it's hard to walk around the world and hard to interact with people normally when you can't even look at them in the eye. This also caused him a lot of back pain because his body was constantly fighting his fused spine in order to stand upright. This occurs in individuals that have something called the HLA-B27 gene. So patients that are identified of having changes to this gene are at risk for having a range of different conditions, one of them being this problem with the spine. It causes problems in other joints as well, especially the sacroiliac joints, also known as the SI joints, in the hips. A lot of times, ankylosing spondylitis is treated with medications. James had come from a country where this condition wasn't recognized very very early in his life, and he didn't have the privilege to have those medications that maybe would have prevented some of the problems he was dealing with now. So I saw James, uh, I did a neurological exam to make sure all the nerves were working fine, and they were. So I sent him to get x-rays so I could really analyze what part of the spine was fused and his overall whole body alignment. And here's what I found. He was essentially fused from the bottom part of his spine all the way up to the top. So from C2, which is almost the highest vertebrae in the neck, all the way down to his pelvis. Not only that, but the joints in his pelvis were also fused. The SI joints, or sacroiliac joints, had also fused together, which a lot of times is the first sign of ankylosing spondylitis. He also had significant hip arthritis. So James basically now had two problems. One of those was that he had arthritis in his hips, and the second one is that his spine had fused itself in a position that was making his entire body pitch itself forward. So we had a long conversation. We talked about what is his options. We talked about what problem should be addressed first. In the end, we decided that we thought it was best to address the spine first. Now, considering that this was a structural problem, there was no physical therapy that was gonna get James to stand upright again. And trust me, he had tried. He had been in, in it for years. The last thing he wanted was a surgery, but it had gotten to the point that he didn't really think he had another choice. We got MRIs as well, we got CT scans, just so I could use them mostly for surgical planning purposes. The other reason I got the CT scan was to look at James's bone quality, because a lot of times the bone quality in patients with ankylosing spondylitis can be somewhat questionable in these patients. So I got a CT scan to see where the bone was poor, where it was strong, and, and use that to kind of plan what I would need to do. The kind of procedure that I suggested for James was something called a pedicle subtraction osteotomy. This is when we cut out a part of the bone, the part called the pedicle, Cutting it out, that's the osteotomy part. And then subtraction, I think, is a little bit redundant. PSO for short is what we call it. And here's what it looked like. James' ankylosing spondylitis was so bad that he actually needed two pedicle subtraction osteotomies. This is a relatively rare case as far as spinal deformities go. We did both of the pedicle subtraction osteotomies in the same surgery. Now, the plan was always that we were gonna do one and if it seemed unsafe at all to do the second one, you know, if he was losing too much blood or, you know, if he was having any anesthetic problems, we were gonna stop the operation and do the second one at another time. Fortunately, the first pedicle subtraction osteotomy or PSO went very well and we were able to do the second one as well in the same setting. And here's what that looked like. This is James looking at him from the beginning, okay? So this is before the surgery and if we look, at the very bottom of his spine, and we measure, we can see that he has almost no backwards curvature. That backwards curvature is called lordosis. That just refers to a backward curvature of the spine, 
And the bottom part of the spine, the lumbar spine, that is where most of the patient's lordosis is concentrated, especially at the very bottom. So for him, he had five degrees. Everybody needs a different amount, but for most people, it's somewhere around 40 degrees or so. So what we did was we planned to cut a wedge into the lower part of the spine in order to give him that lordosis or backwards curvature back. The second part was that I knew that wasn't gonna quite be enough because his whole spine was involved, not just the bottom. I debated between where to put, or where to cut out the other wedge, you know, where to do the other PSO. In the end, after talking with a few of my uh, partners, which is what we always like to do when cases are complicated, I decided that the other good place to do it would be at what's called L1, which is the upper part of the lumbar spine. So that's what we did. And so here are the x-rays. So you can see now, when you compare him before and after, you can see that he's standing much more upright than he was before. You can see that we did this wedge cut at the bottom part of the spine. So where he previously had five degrees, he now has almost 50 or 48 degrees. And then in this top part right here, he previously had a little bit of kyphosis, which is forward curvature. So what we did with that part is we improved the kyphosis and got him to about neutral through that region. So by improving kyphosis in one part of the spine and increasing lordosis or backwards curvature in another part, we were able to give him a much more balanced spine. Clinically, he walks in the room and he's able to look at you right in the eyes, which is a big difference for him. And does he have some back pain still? Yes, but that's because Ankylosing spondylitis is not a normal condition, but it's also not a normal condition to have screws and rods in your back. So you trade one abnormal situation for another one. Now, his back pain's not 100% gone, but I wouldn't really expect it to with the condition that he has, but he's much, much better. He's functioning much better walking around, and overall, he's very pleased with his result.